Hello and welcome to the third talk in the 3IE How To video lecture series. This talk will discuss the issues which arise in managing a randomised controlled trial or RCT. So what are these issues? The first one is that RCT has to have an ex ante design. You can't take an existing project and randomise which communities or households get the project because the project's already started. So you have to think about a randomised controlled trial at the design stage of the project. The earlier, the better. Second, we're doing these studies to inform policy. So as a researcher conducting a randomised controlled trial, you have to make sure that the evaluation questions you're going to answer are those which are of interest to the policymaker. You need to avoid the temptation to try and shift the focus of the intervention, of the study, to look at questions of interest to you or fellow researchers you can perhaps publish in an academic journal. Policy relevance is the key in managing an RCT. You need to get the buy-in of all stakeholders, those policy makers, but many other stakeholders too, and I'll come back to who they are in a moment. You need to have realistic timelines, which includes anticipating problems which may arise and how you'll deal with them. So don't over-promise with unduly unrealistic short timelines for your study. Anticipate and overcome opposition to randomisation that's going to occur, which might stall or undermine the integrity of the design. You need to establish clear eligibility criteria for who's eligible for the intervention and then identify the population satisfying those criteria over which you're going to conduct the randomisation. As in any research conductor of human subjects, ethical considerations are important, so you need to be explaining to them about the nature and purpose of the trial and you need to make sure that transparency is maintained in the implementation of the evaluation. And finally, you need to monitor and preserve the integrity of design you put in place whilst being aware of any programme changes which have occurred, which therefore require you to actually perhaps modify the questions you're answering, for example, in your randomised controlled trial survey that you're conducting. I'm going to pick out four of these issues to talk about them in a bit more detail. The first is the need to ensure stakeholder buy-in. The second is the need to anticipate problems. The third is to overcome opposition to randomisation. And finally, the ethical considerations. So who are these stakeholders whose buy-in is so important? First of all, politicians. What do politicians want? Politicians want to get elected. They want to be popular with their constituents. So, for example, in the evaluation of a conditional cash transfer in Nicaragua, the provincial governor in one of the states gave a similar program to the CCT to communities in the control group precisely because they were the control group and so therefore weren't getting the program. Him doing that undermined the integrity of the randomised controlled trial by contaminating the control group. Agency management are also important. Agency management need to understand and buy into the implications of an RCT for the timing and rollout of the programme and not put pressures on programme managers that would compromise that design and agreed rollout schedule. They shouldn't be putting pressures on programme managers to go to scale when you still need to have a control group. Product managers themselves, of course, need to understand the importance of a randomised control trial and stick to the agreed protocol for who gets the programme and when they get the programme. And field staff also need to understand that. For example, in an evaluation of eyeglasses in China, eyeglasses were given to secondary school students to improve their learning outcomes, but doctors carrying out the eye tests and giving the glasses to students, having finished that work, in the treatment areas, went to the control schools and gave out glasses in the control schools, thus contaminating the design. They hadn't been properly made to understand why it's important to preserve an untreated control group. Local government officials also play a goal, key role, which could include, of course, community leaders, who play a key role in getting community buy-in and acceptance of the programme itself, and the importance of being a controlled community, if indeed they are a controlled community. 
and finally the beneficiaries themselves need to understand the importance of the programme and the importance of the programme design and the evaluation design and I'll come back to that when I talk about ethical considerations in a moment. You need to anticipate problems that may occur in the project and therefore undermine the study as well. There's often suspicion and distrust amongst intended beneficiaries about the true intentions of those carrying out the project. For example, in Bangladesh, where the study team gave plates to girls uh, taking part in a survey they were conducting, there were rumours in the villages that these plates were poisoned in some way. And furthermore, rumours that the study team were trying to convert the girls to Christianity. The result was in 30 villages, study teams were confronted by angry mobs and couldn't at that time carry out the surveys they needed to do for the study. Similarly in Kenya, a study of a malaria intervention was taking blood samples which around suspicions about what the blood was being used for, rumours that the blood was being stolen, rumours of vampires are very common in many parts of Africa, rumours that this was covert HIV testing, and rumours that the drugs itself were not safe, which undermined again compliance with the intervention, undermined the ability to evaluate the intervention, because the intervention itself was not being carried out in the way in which it had been intended. There can be opposition to the intervention, and of course there's opposition often to randomisation, from the top, from politicians, from programme staff, and maybe also intended beneficiaries or those in the control group who want to know why they're not getting the programme now. So what can we say to them? To politicians, we can always point out that we're not creating the fact that there's an untreated, untreated population by having a control group. For nearly all programmes, there will be an untreated population. Very few programmes are universal from day one. They're either rolled out over time or they operate in certain regions. So a randomised controlled trial exploits that fact of an untreated population to get a control group. It doesn't create the fact that there is an untreated population. Secondly, randomisation is more transparent. When it comes to allocating programme resources, if we do it by, ran by random, random assignment, then we know why it is certain communities or households are getting intervention and others aren't, rather than, being, rather than there being accusations of nepotism or favouritism in the allocation of programme resources. And finally, it's not doing a randomised controlled trial that's unethical. It's spending development resources on programmes that may not work. And unless we do impact evaluations, such as randomised control trials, we don't know if those programmes work or not. So doing randomised control trials is the ethical choice. It's not doing them, which is unethical. What do we say to say, however, to programme managers, who are the ones that face whatever logistical difficulties may arise in implementing a randomised control trial? First of all, we don't normally need to randomise a whole programme. Programmes are often very large. When we do our power calculations, we'll probably discover that only a fraction of the programme needs to be randomised, maybe 20%. So for 80% of the programme, you know, programme managers can carry on and do the programme exactly how and when, where they intended to. Just for 20%, if we're, say, going to do a pipeline randomisation, all we're asking is that we randomise the order in which those 20% of the programme receive the study. It's not really making much difference to the programme as a whole. And that's the thing to emphasise, is that you can have randomised controlled trial designs that make very little difference to the design implementation of the programme. So a pipeline randomisation is one example. We heard in the second video lecture in this series about the raised threshold design as another example of a RCT design that makes very little difference to the implementation of that program. And finally, of course, there are encouragement designs, we also heard about last time, which again don't change the nature of the program as implementation whatsoever, and actually yield information on how to increase participation rates and take up of that program. And finally, you don't need to have a no treatment control group. When we do clinical trials, there's not normally a no treatment control group. Rather, the control group receives the existing treatment. 
And so we can do the same thing with a randomized control trial in the development setting. The control group can get whatever existing policy or programs are in place. And that's the policy question of interest to policymakers. They don't want to know, oh, how's this program compared to doing nothing? They want to know, how's this com program compare to what we're doing already? Is this program better use of resources than how we're currently spending our resources? So we can make randomized control trials often more policy relevant by not having a no treatment control group. Finally, and most importantly, are the ethical considerations. Like any human subject research in a field setting, you need to get informed consent and approval of the subjects taking part in the research. Very often, development RCTs are cluster RCTs, and so you're randomizing, say, at village level, and so then often the consent may come from village leaders, and that's taken as an acceptable way of getting consent. Those village leaders are very important stakeholders at getting the participation of the community members. But all community members need to understand what's going on. They need to understand both the intervention and that they're subject to a randomised controlled trial in which whether they get the programme or not has been chosen by a fair method of random allocation amongst the eligible population. And you can increase that understanding by using public randomization ceremonies such as that shown in the photo here. It's increasingly common that randomization takes place in public. So for example, in a health uh, program, the managers of the health centers involved will come to a, a central place where they actually take part themselves in drawing out of the hat or a box the name of the health centers to see which group treatment group, different treatments, control group, the different centres are being allocated to. And finally, the key thing on the ethical front is to make sure that we take the findings back to the people they're intended to benefit. Impact evaluation research should not be extractive research. Impact evaluation research should not be research in which researchers take the data back to their universities in Europe or North America, analyse those data, publish a paper and move on. We want those data, those study findings, to make a lasting difference in policy, a lasting difference in people's lives. So researchers need to take those findings back to the communities where the data were collected, explain the study findings, both to the treatment group and to the control group. Explain what these findings mean to help empower those people to demand programs that can actually help them improve their lives. To say no to programs that have been shown not to work. Impact evaluations can make a difference, but only if we as researchers do what it is that motivates us to become research and development in the first place. To help improve the lives of poor people which is to take the findings back to the poor people so they can use them for better lives. So thank you for listening to this lecture. I hope you found it useful, and I encourage you to please go on and listen to the other lectures in this series.